Bismillah wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa man wala wa ba'd Allahumma alamna ma yanfa'una wa anfa'na bima 'allamtana wa zidna 'ilman ya rabbil alamin Allahumma salli wa sallim wa zid wa barik ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in Where did we stop yesterday, Ani? Um, uh, we're having an auction here. 18, 17. Do I, do I hear 15? Hmm? Okay. So I'm asking Ali, unless everyone here is named Ali. Okay. So there's one more point that we'll cover on Hadith 16 before we'll go forward. And that is probably going to solve at least some issues that many of you seem to have. And that is when selling something, okay? I'll make this point. We mentioned the hadith or the end of the hadith here, وَلَا بِعْ مَا لَيْسَ عِنْدَكَ Selling something which you don't have. And we mentioned that it is explained by the narrators of the hadith as ma la tamlik. And this is found in another hadith of Hakim ibn Hizam radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Wa la tabi' ma la tamlik. And do not sell what you do not own. So there is a difference. So let's just take this very fine caribou coffee cup. Okay. This cup in my hands. Me selling you this cup in my hands is different than me selling you a caribou coffee cup that is orange with a tan bottom. Does everyone understand the difference between that? Which means if I sell you a caribou cup, you go, that caribou cup? I said, no, one just like this. Exact same specifications. Exact same height, exact same weight, exact same volume, holds the exact same amount of coffee. The exact type of cup, but not this cup, because this cup is mine. There's a difference between me selling that and me selling you this cup in particular. This cup in particular is what is meant by this hadith. Do not sell something that you don't have or do not sell something that you do not own. So if Ali tried to sell you this cup, and this cup is with me, okay, it's mine, then he's selling something that he doesn't have and he doesn't own. And so when he does so, he's going to take your money and consume it mis uh, uh, in inappropriately. However, if somebody says, hey Ali, I like that cup that the Sheikh had, it's really nice, do you think that you can get me one? And he knows where the supplier is and he knows what kind of cup it is and he knows that he can advertise it and put it out there for the people. Then he can sell you this cup even though he, he can sell you a cup like it even though he doesn't own it yet because he, with two conditions. One condition is that he has to take responsibility, he has to take liability for refunds and returns, number one. And number two, he has to take either a down payment or the entire payment now. And we know this from the hadith of Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu. It's not in the 40 hadith that we're mentioning here, but it is found in Sahih al-Bukhari. Atta Nabiyu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ila al-Madinah فَوَجَدَ النَّاسَ يُسْلِفُونَ فِي الثِّمَارِ السَّنَةَ وَالسَّنَتَيْنِ فَقَالَ مَنْ أَسْلَفَ فَلْيُسْلِفْ فِي كَيْدٍ مَعْلُومٍ أَوْ وَزْدٍ مَعْلُومٍ إِلَىٰ أَجَلٍ مَعْلُومٍ The Prophet ﷺ came to al Medina, 
And he found people doing forward sales, selling in the fu- to the future for future delivery by one or two years into the future. And so he said, whoever wants to sell something to, for future delivery, then he must do so for a known price. Oh, في كيد معلوم أو وزن معلوم إلى أجل معلوم for a known volume or a known weight for a and a known delivery date. And generally, our scholars have said that anything that is going to define the specifications of the thing that you're selling more needs to be mentioned because that will have an effect on the price of the of the thing that you are buying. So if you know that dates of a certain area don't, uh, aren't, aren't grown and aren't harvested except at a certain time of year and you want to pre-order for that, it's allowed for you to pre-order. As long as you know the type, as long as you know the volume or the weight, as long as you know the delivery date. And then on the seller side, they have to take liability for refunds and returns. They don't have to be the person growing the dates. They could simply be a middle a middleman, like in this in the in the issue of drop shipping. Now, some of you uh, uh, pro- probably wondering, well, what happens when you drop ship something and it can't be delivered? Well, you're not allowed to just pass your your customer along to the supplier and say it's your problem, deal with it, and then you take their money and eat their money up and leave them high and dry. You either have to refund them or you have to take a role along with the supplier in making sure that that item is delivered. So this is something called bayr al mawsuf selling something as described, as opposed to selling something bayr al ain selling something in particular. I think that was important uh, to mention as a lot of what we're studying are general principles. And when we go to the next hadith, we're going to go through a rubric of different types of contracts. And again, what I mentioned yesterday about your, your mind being like a stovetop and you needing to allow things to simmer in the back and not boil up in the front, you're going to have to do that. So the important thing here is, hear what's being said, write it down, go over the possibilities. The worst thing that you can do at this point is to start to try and apply everything to your very, very specific situation and then go, oh my God, my whole life, I'm doing all this, it's all haram. Don't do that. Understand the principles. Yes, attempt to understand how they would be applied understand completely the situation that you're in, and then understand as well that in studying books of hadith, we're studying the general principles that are taken from the hadith. But we're not studying the chapter of fiqh holistically as you would when you're studying a book of fiqh. For each of these hadith, they're used in many different ways throughout the books of fiqh, and they're taken into consideration along with the general principles that are found in the Qur'an as well as other things found in the hadith and in the ijma'at and the, consen- the, the points of consensus from scholars. So we're, we're essentially going over the broad, large issues. But when we want to start going and applying these issues, we need to go and study a book, the chapter of Mu'amalat, the chapter of financial transactions in a book of fiqh so that we can better understand holistically how all of this puts the, uh, goes together. So it's, it's many of our, our, our teachers used to say that the study of fiqh is a never-ending endeavor. When you start with A, you'll get to Z, and then you restart again. It's like a child, they learn their ABCs, and then they learn simple words, and then they learn simple sentences, and then they learn simple paragraphs, And then they start over again with learning advanced words and advanced sentences and advanced paragraphs. So you have levels of literacy in the language that you know, and you'll have levels of literacy in fiqh as well. And the more time that you give yourself to process and the more time that you say to yourself, 
look, I don't know, and I'm not going to put myself at a disadvantage just because I don't know. I'm going to continue learning so I'm at more of an advantage. The better off you're going to be throughout all of this, inshallah ta'ala. Yes, it is, it is exemplary for you to be afraid of falling into the haram. But it is not exemplary for you to jump the gun and apply something to some, somewhere it doesn't apply. Because we're not covering all of the details that have to do with these issues. We're covering the main evidences and some of the general principles from them. Sound good? No? Everyone's quiet. Sound good? Okay, alhamdulillah. So if you guys didn't sound good, I'll just leave. And then, khalas, it'll be the, 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 the 16 hadith about... Okay, bismillah. Okay, so I use a very specific term here, arrears. Who knows what the, the word arrears is defined as? And you can look it up on your phone really quickly. Raise your hand if you find the definition. Yes? Money that is owed that should have been paid earlier. So, first of all, this hadith is found in Al-Bayhaqi. It's narrated from Abdullah ibn Umar. And, Naha an bay' al-kalik bil kalik. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam forbade selling arrears for arrears. He, he forbade selling money that is owed that should have been paid earlier for money that is owed that it should have been paid earlier. We'll get into that in a moment. The hadith is la'if. The hadith, as a hadith narrated back to the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, is la'if, it's weak. Why are we mentioning a weak hadith here? Why? Who here is a student of hadith here at the university? Hmm? It has what? It has qara'in. Such as? Such as the hadith, the, pr the previous hadith. And? What else might, might allow us? Why do scholars mention weak hadith in books when they're weak? First of all, because when you're mentioning a book of 40 hadith, it doesn't, mention, doesn't, mean, it doesn't uh, make sense to mention 39 hadith plus one point of ijma. You want to mention the hadith. Number two, this point that it's forbidden to sell arrears for arrears is a point of ijma, of consensus between all of the scholars. So we know that the hukum, the ruling found in this narration, although it is weak, is correct. So there is something called the relative truth value of a narration and the veracity of that narration. So yes, while we don't have, for example, an isnad, a chain of narration that goes back, that is pristine and is considered sahih or hasan, all we have is the weak narration, we find that the point being made has been upheld by scholars from the earliest generations of Islam until today. Meaning that what's found in that weak hadith, له أصل في الشرع كما قاله ابن رجب في بعض رسائله that it has a basis in the Sharia as Hafiz ibn Rajab says in some of his uh, treatises. So we mention it here, number one, so that you know that if somebody quotes it as a statement from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, that it's not a statement that's found directly from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, but it is a correct concept, and it is one that was upheld by Muslim scholars for ages. So when we are attributing things to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, we want to attribute them as they have been narrated, clarifying 
their grade as to whether they are authentic, inauthentic, weak, extremely weak, and if they have supporting evidences from other uh, sources, such as the statements of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the ijma'at and the, and the points of consensus by scholars throughout history. Now notice that there is an explanation for this from the Muwatta of Imam Malik. Interestingly enough, uh, Imam, Imam Malik doesn't narrate the hadith in the Muwatta, but he mentions the issue and the point of consensus because he found, he found the hadith was weak. So we're mentioning it here so that you know that it's been mentioned and also allude, or, or pointing out to you that this is a point of ijma. So what does this mean? Arrears for arrears, money that is owed that should have been paid earlier, is when a man sells a debt that he owes someone else for a debt that is owed to another person. Um, I think they brought a, a, a blackboard up here. Uh, we won't use it. Um, any form of transaction that two people enter into has three possibilities. They are either trading an asset for an asset, or they are trading an asset for a liability or they are trading a liability for a liability. أَيُّ مُعَامَلَةٍ بَيْنَ إِثْتَيْنِ فَلَا بُدَّ أَنْ يَكُونَ إِمَّا عَيْنٌ بِعَيْنٍ أَوْ عَيْنٌ بِشَيْءٍ فِي الذِّمَّةِ أَوْ شَيْءٍ فِي الذِّمَّةِ بِشَيْءٍ فِي الذِّمَّةِ And these three situations either will be immediately delivered so there'll be spot transactions from both sides. They'll be deferred from both sides. Or they'll be, or one of them will be given now spot and the other one will be deferred. So we essentially have nine different types of transactions. If we have the sale of an asset, for the sale of an asset, that happens immediately. This is like me saying, I will sell you my car, I'll sell you this cup for $10. I'll give you this cup now, $10 now. Permissible? What do we call this? Yeah, what do we call the type of sale? We call it bayer. We call it a sale, right? Bayer and mutlaq. An unrestricted sale. Okay? What if I said, I'll sell you this cup or this type of cup after a year for $20 upon delivery? And am I giving you this cup right away? Are you giving me the $20 right away? What's happening? Both are deferred, but what's happening? You're pre-ordering a type of asset. You're pre-ordering a type of asset. And this is something called a stisna, basically like an EPC contract, engineer procure construct contract. You're putting in a purchase order for something that has to be constructed. Let's just say this isn't manufactured yet. This is just a prototype. You're putting in a purchase order, and this is permissible. Number two, or number three, let's say I'll give you this cup now, and you'll pay me a dollar for the next 10 months. Permissible? Yes? No? Maybe so? Anyone? Yes? You sure? I'll give you a cup now. You pay me a dollar over the next 10 months. One dollar a month over the next 10 months. Permissible? Yes. yes. What, what, what is the sale called? In Arabic, they call it bayr taqsid. In English, they would just say, on, I bought it on payments. Permissible. So there's a three of the nine types. 
Number two, we have assets that are being sold for an asset being sold for a liability. So, when you rent an apartment, what do you, when you rent an apartment or rent a car, what's being delivered? What, what, what are you, what are you, what are you, what's the thing that you, that's being used at that time? Say again? It's an asset. What, what part of an asset? Every asset has a beneficial use and it has the asset itself, which in Arabic they call al manfa'a wa raqaba So you have the asset, and in English they call it the usufruct, okay, the beneficial portion of. If I, give, if I rent you a car, are you allowed to take the car to the scrapyard and sell it for the price of its metal? Why not? Because you, what you're contracting for is the use of the car, not the actual material of the car. So you're taking control, you're basically holding a liability that you will be liable for the asset, the actual physical asset, and then you'll benefit from its use over the lease period. So what's being given up front at this point? Money, you're paying the money first, and then you're using the benefit of the car over the time of rental. So this is an example of an asset, the money that's given up front for a liability, which is the use of the car over time. All right, let's say for example, <clears throat> you have a local bakery and you want to purchase, you want to get bread from them every single day. So every single day you walk by the, the, the khabaz, you walk by the baker and you pick up bread, okay? What, what's, what, what, what's the famous, fav, favorite bread that people eat up here? Somebody said gyro? Huh? Injira? Anjiro. Okay. Okay, anjiro or roti or what? What else? Chapati. Chapati? No, uh, we, we, we're not going to go with chapati. Too much oil. So let's just say you pass by the baker every single day and you pick up bread every single day. And then at the end of the month, you go back and you say, hey, what's my tab? with you. And he says, your tab is, it's a dollar a day, so you owe me $30. So now, you've just taken an asset every single day, which is the bread, and you paid a liability later on, which means essentially you agreed for deferred payment and the, the obligation that he would provide you with bread every single day. So it's like a supply contract. And this is permissible, even though each of the two things is being delivered later, there's a standing agreement between you for supply. In Arabic, they call it aqt tawrid. And in the books of fiqh, they call it bay'at ahl al-Madina, sale of the people of Medina, because this is something that they would engage in in Medina from the earliest times. No one ever said anything about it being Haram. Okay, number two, C, or number six. And that is an asset for a liability that is spot on one sense, or on one, money is given up front and the product is delivered later. What's an example of this? We just mentioned it earlier. The hadith of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, contract known as Salam, which is a forward sale, where I'm paying a portion or all of the price of an asset, and for a discount, for a discount, I'm going to have it delivered to me later, because it is yet to be delivered or processed through the supply chain. This is known as Salam, or some, some scholars would call it Salaf, but Salaf was also known as a loan. So we'll use the word salam, and this is permissible due to the hadith of Abdullah ibn 
Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Number seven. Number seven, we go back to, or now we have a liability in exchange for liability. And both of these liabilities are being uh, traded now, immediately, at a spot transaction. What's an example of this? Let's say, for example, Ali, I owe you $500, okay? And you owe me $300. So we meet up and I say, Ali, you remember the $500 I owe you? He says, yeah. You remember you owed me 300? He says, yeah. What's the quickest way for us both to get our rights uh, uh, taken care of? Say again. You give me, I give you 200. Ah, see, smart, mashallah. I give him $200. Now the debt that I had, that I owed him, is extinguished. The debt that he owed me is extinguished. And we just traded $200 between us. So essentially, settling a debt with a debt. This is permissible. With two conditions. Per the hadith of Abdullah ibn Umar, radiallahu anhu, kuntu abi'u niyaq aw naqa Ibn Umar عنه, used to sell camels behind Al-Baqir, the graveyard in Medina. فَكُنْتُ أُبِيعُهَا بِالذَّهَبْ وَأَقْتَضِي بِالْفِضَّةِ وَأَبِيعُهَا بِالْفِضَّةِ وَأَقْتَضِي بِالذَّهَبْ فَأَسَأَلْتُ عَنْ ذَلِكَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ فَقَالَ بِعْ بِالذَّهَبْ this hadith is found in the Sahihain that Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, he would sell camels behind Baqir. And he would sell them for gold, but he would be paid in silver. Or he'd sell them for silver, and he would be paid in gold. And so he went and asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because he was worried about this. So the Prophet ﷺ said, you can do that with two conditions. That number one, what are, the we, what are the two conditions we just mentioned? Rah. That number one, you exchange the values. إِذَا كَانَ بِسِعْرِ يَوْمِهِ وَلَمْ يَبْقَى بَيْنَكُمَا شَيْءٍ that you exchange the value of the gold for the value of the silver per the current exchange rate and that there's nothing left between you. So there's no further debt that's owed after that. Because you don't want to give somebody the ability to arbitrage into the future by simply kicking the can down the road and rolling over the debt into future time periods. So if I went to Ali and I bought something from him for $500, $500 US, okay? And then he said, you know what? I'm going to Canada soon, so if you have Canadian dollars, I'll take the Canadian dollars. He said, okay, we're going to calculate how much the Canadian dollar converts into the US dollar, and then I'm going to pay him that amount in total. If there's any difference between the two amounts, then whoever it's owed to has to take it at that point. And so clearing and settlement is permissible with two conditions. That the clearing and the settlement between two different currencies is done at the spot price, the exchange rate, the spot exchange rate, and there's no remaining debt after that. Everybody's made whole. So what number are we on? Seven. Now we're on eight. So now we have a liability for liability that is deferred from both sides. Is everyone lost yet? Yes? No? Okay, again, don't worry. Remember the example I gave you yesterday of ten, you know, waiting 10 years to find the answer to an issue? Inshallah, you won't have to wor wor wait 10 years. All right? 
Now we have a liability for a liability that is deferred from both sides. Number eight here is hadith number 17, arrears for arrears. The brother said is defined as? Sahib at tarif yes. The arrears is defined as money owed that should have been paid earlier. So it's a standing debt. So let's say, for example, that, what's your name, brother? Musa. I owe Musa $500. Okay? And Ali, he owes Ibrahim $300. Okay? So Ali and I are talking. And he says, you know what? I'm going to uh, meet with Musa later on today. And you're going to meet with Ibrahim later on today. So why don't I just sell you the debt that's, uh, that, that, that's owed to me, and you sell the debt, that's owed, or the, the debt you owe to Musa, you sell it to me for the debt that I owe to Ibrahim, and we both pay each other off. We both pay off our debts. And then we're all clear. Why would I accept, or why would he accept, to pay my debt of $500 when he only owes money to Ibrahim for $300? He owes $200 less to Ibrahim. Why would he accept that? Why would he accept that? Because he knows that if he, he's, got, he's in Musa's good graces, and he's like, man, I know this guy. I can haggle him down. I can, you know, I can get a discount from him. And I'll, I'll say, you know what? Uh, Joe couldn't pay you. Let me pay you. I, I, I'll give you 200 for the debt that's owed to him. So now what happens? So now he got me to pay his $300 debt for the price of 200 Where did the rest of the money go? You can't whisper, you have to speak up. Where did the rest of the money go? See? No, I don't have to pay you anything. You bought, the, you bought my debt, I bought your debt. We exchanged debts. Now I'm going to pay Ibrahim and you're going to pay Musa. If you can't haggle him down, you've got to pay the whole 500. If I can't haggle him down, I've got to pay the whole 300. Who eats the difference here? Ali might. Or if Ibrahim and Musa are haggled down and not given their full right, then they have to eat the difference. What has actually been done that justifies that difference being carried by somebody that it, wasn't, that, that it was owed to? Hmm? Time? No. It doesn't justify it. That's, what, that's the whole point. When you switch the liabilities, when you trade liabilities like this, then you're essentially placing the burden of payment on a person who it was never their burden to pay in the first place. Therefore, you're shifting the risk off of yourself to someone else without that risk being tied to an actual asset or an actual service that should be profited from. Remember yesterday, we said that you should profit off of things because of two things, ownership of an actual asset or actions that add value to a, a situation, like a service or, or, or to that asset. يعني الربح الربح يكون بملك so here, what work was put in? Nothing. What asset was it connected to? Nothing. So in essent essentially what I did was something called أَكَلْ أَمْوَالَ النَّاسِ بِالْبَاطِرِ I devoured other people's wealth without right. I shifted the risk off of myself and the, and the liability and I put it on someone else who may or may not be able to handle that liability. Now you might be saying to yourself, well, what does that have to do with me? All right, well, look at most 
major financial crises of the past 20 years, and they're because of this. The futures market, in, uh, the you know, um, uh, uh, de default credit swaps, all of this stuff is, is cadet big cadet. It's arrears for arrears. It's people trading in debt for more debt. Okay, I'm not gonna give you money now for more money later. I'll give you less debt for more debt later. What are they banking on? They're banking on somebody defaulting or not being able to pay that debt. And so they diminish the liability on them. In general though, what happens with big corporations? Who gets stuck with the bill? Taxpayer, Taxpayer right? So society as a whole struggles because of that. So this is when you have what? A liability or for a liability, both of them are deferred. You can cancel out the amounts and you're simply left with, in our situation, $200 for more time, which is exactly the logic of riba. Exactly the logic of riba. It's exactly the logic of zidni unvurk. Give me more time and I'll pay you more later. And I know this might be something to wrap your head around, but again, go over this again, and inshallah ta'ala will start to become clear. Lastly, we have a liability for a liability. One liability is paid now, and the other liability is paid later. Give me an example of that. You guys earlier were making an auction over the numbers of the hadith, but you're not making an auction for answering. What if I said to you, I'll give you $100 now, and you give me 110 later. If you give me $100 now, what's the liability that was created? A debt of $100. And what am I promising for payment later? A liability of me paying $10 extra. So an interest-based loan. A RIBA-based loan. Permissible or impermissible? Permissible. impermissible, of course. If you said permissible, we have guys outside that will fight you outside the door. Not messing around. So now you see that there are nine different situations that transactions happen under Islamic law. You have transactions that are assets for assets, liabilities for assets, or liabilities for liabilities. Each, th each of those three can either be deferred from both sides, spot on both sides, or one of them spot and one of them deferred. Clear, everyone? Kind of? Sort of? It will become clearer as long as you do two things. As long as you review what we talked about, and as long as you continue to study these chapters on, uh, on fiqh, right? So let's, I think that it'll become even clearer bi-idhnillahi ta'ala when we do the next hadith. So, bismillah. <laughs> Epitome. Okay, so what's going on in this hadith? I always tell people, in order to properly understand these issues, I, we, I think we talked about this yesterday or, 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 or the day before. Maybe I didn't use this phrase. Sometimes we have to be time travelers. And we have to transport our minds back to the rural, farm-based life of people that were living during the time of the Prophet, alayhi salatu 
So the Prophet وسلم, conquers Khaybar. Khaybar is where? Khaybar is about a hundred kilometers northwest, or yeah, northwest of Al Medina. It's known for its vegetation. So in Khaybar and in the areas around there, they had dates, they had grapes, it's some pomegranates. Pomegranates were more prominent in Ta'if, however. And so the Prophet ﷺ places a man as a governor over Khaybar. Who is that man? The other narrations mention that it is Bilal. Ta'ala so Bilal brings the Prophet ﷺ some of the high quality dates that they produce there in Khaybar. And this is what they call in Arabic, Janib. A Jannabahu an tumur al ukhra So it's like, uh, uh, you know, select dates. All right? They, 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 they separate it, segregate it from all of the other dates. These are really high quality. We're not going to allow them to be mixed with all of the other dates. So the Prophet ﷺ says, are all of the dates of Khaybar like this? He's amazed at the quality. So Bilal he says, لا يا رسول الله. No, Messenger of Allah, we buy one sot, one, let's just say, kilo of these high quality dates for two kilos of poor quality dates. And we buy two kilos for three. The Prophet والسلام, he says, لا تفعل. Do not do this. Bi'al jama' Sell the mix. Sell the mix of low quality dates. Bid darahim. For silver. For silver coins. Dirhams. Then, use the silver coins, silver dirhams to buy the high quality dates. So we started off with two people in a transaction. Okay? We started off with two people in a transaction. Number one, we have the person who owns high quality dates and the second person owns low quality dates. So the person who has the high quality date says, I'm only going to sell it to you for two pounds or one pound of high quality dates or one kilo for, of high quality dates for two pounds of low quality dates. What happens when all of the high quality dates are gone? What happens? No more high quality dates. They've all been eat it, eaten and harvested. What, what's left? Low quality dates. So now, also, who owns all the low quality dates now? Our, our, our guy here, number one. Okay? The guy in the first, who, who first had all the high quality dates, okay? We can actually put him like this, and the person with the low quality dates here. So now we had two kilos or two pounds going upwards to this guy, right? Now, all of the, the low quality dates that we sold to him for high quality dates, they become the next in line for quality. So then what do we do? Now he comes back and we say, hey, we still need to eat dates because everybody ate dates at that time. Okay, well, these low quality dates, now I want four kilos of whatever else you have for two kilos of this. So we went one for two, now we went two for four. I'm gonna go four for eight. What's happening to the value and the staple foods in the society? A monopoly is being created and a monopoly is being created and there's a liquidity trap. All of the value is flowing in one direction. Where to? To whoever was rich enough to have the high quality dates. Which is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, why does he mention the issue of sadaqah and transactions why are all of these rulings given? So that wealth isn't circulated only amongst the richest of you. So when we, only, when we, when we allow riba, we're allowing for people to earn above the real economy. 
They don't need to do anything else other than have wealth. And they can see the wealth flow up to them. So not only is there monopoly, not only is there an increased amount of debt because people will increasingly not be able to buy food unless they go into debt, there's also inflation in what they're paying with. Sound familiar? And there's a liquidity trap. Everything is flowing in one direction. So what did the Prophet ﷺ say is the solution to this issue? What did he say here in the hadith? So now we got the guy with the high quality dates. We got the guy with the low quality dates. Now we're going to introduce somebody over here on the side. No, don't go and give dates for dates. Take your low quality dates, two pounds of low quality dates. Sell them to this guy over here for silver. Now that you've got silver, now you're not, and what did you do? You just created two people with supply of dates and you have money that's accepted by both. Now you have greater bargaining power with the person with high quality dates. So you've done something called mark to market. You've entered an inefficiency, this is economic, you know, economics talk. You've created an inefficiency for the purpose of equality. So, so no, 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 we should just trade date for, date for date. That just makes more sense. It's faster. We don't have to worry about putting in cash transactions. We don't have to worry about middlemen. No, there is actual benefit for there being middlemen. There is actual benefit for there being cash transactions. Because what are we doing? We're forcing the person with all of the wealth to negotiate with us. So I might say, okay, he says, okay, I'll sell you, you know, two, you know, one kilo of good dates for two kilos of bad dates. And I go to this guy who's just going to give me money for it. And I say, how much, how much do you want if I sell you two kilos of lower quality dates? And he says, oh, I'll pay you five, five dirhams, five silver coins. And I go to the guy with the, the, the good quality dates and I say, look, uh, I, don't, I don't have my bad quality, my lower quality dates anymore. I've just got money. What do you, how much money do you want for the low quality, or the low quality dates? I'm sorry, the high quality dates that you have. How much money do you want? He says, you know, I only want three, three dirhams. What did I do? I just saved myself a value of two dirhams. We can say it with dollars. I just saved myself a value. I bought from this guy, I got $5. I repurchased or I purchased the high quality dates for $3. I now have high quality dates to eat and I have $2 left over. So I actually allowed wealth to stay with me even though I have less wealth than the wealthy. I didn't allow the liquidity to all flow in one direction. So I'm allowing what? A, a equality and choice over efficiency. This is because Islam seeks a dynamic economy where the largest group of people can find the largest amount of benefit. And wealth does not simply end up in the hands of the rich. That there's real economic activity. So riba is the greatest form of welfare in human history. Riba is the greatest form of welfare in human history. Because when you are taking money for doing nothing other than having money and charging people to create economic activity that may win or lose, but you never lose, you're simply asking people to pay you for existing. You are placing yourself in the position of Allah as Rabb. You're saying, I am the one that all is owed to and I owe nothing. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reserves that right for himself. Who is it that will give a goodly loan to Allah so that he can multiply it for them? Notice when Allah ta talks to us about Jannah, he uses the same exact logic of riba. He uses the same exact logic. 
Who's going to give me a loan so that I can return the loan to him? Why is Allah allowed to do that? Because he controls everything in the heavens and the earth. Why, is Allah, Allah, why does Allah have the name Al-Mutakabbir? Because he's the only person that he's the only one, the only entity that has the right to have any kibr. Pride is considered deficiency in everyone else but Allah. Because he has no deficiencies. Just as illiteracy is considered a deficiency in everyone else. Except who? The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because it's a sign of his greatness. So the point being here, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, after explaining, does everyone get what's happening with the money and the staple goods in society? So you can take dates, you can take wheat, you can take whatever you want. You can take, you know, this is why I want to think, you know, you know, don't trade in your car. We're not saying that, you know, cars for cars or riba anything. But the idea is the economic activity. You actually end up, if you trade in your car to a, to a dealership, you actually get less than if you sold it in the open market. Why? Because they want to take advantage of the fact that all of the money is flowing in one, in one, in one direction and that somehow, hey, that's efficient. Don't you want to be efficient? Don't you want to get done with this quickly? So the Prophet is saying, no, efficiency is not the key all the time. Sometimes it's better to have inefficiencies that protect the rights of everybody in society. So yes, is it more trouble to go and sell it in the marketplace and get money and then take the money and then buy the things that you want? Yes. But what does it do? It creates choice, it creates equality, it creates a, a, a money flow through all sectors of society, and it allows for greater liquidity and better pricing. And therefore, the opposite of vum, the idea of adl, the idea of justice instead of injustice. So Islam forbids riba. And it forbids monopolies. And it forbids broad pricing, uh, uh, forced prices. And it allows specific prices to be, to, to, be, to be dictated. And it mandates that we pay zakat. And it recommends that we give sadaqah. All of these for the purpose of making sure that there is a free flow of funds in society and that all can be cared for and all can enjoy the good of society. Which is why at the end the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said here, Awah, riba la tafal. Oof, oof. This is the epitome of riba. This is the absolute essence of riba. What's the absolute essence of riba? That you are becoming subjugated and all the value that you have is flowing to someone who is doing nothing other than having something that you want. So you are being taken advantage of for the benefit of someone who put no work, had no risk, and reaps all of the reward. Everyone get, get what we're saying here? Clear? Clear as mud? Or clearer? Clear as water? Okay. Swamp water or like? Okay, alhamdulillah. So again, if anything's not clear, uh, you know, write your questions down, send your questions up. What we're going to do is collate all of the questions and then answer them at once. Because a lot of the things that we're covering in this book are interconnected. As you can see, hadiths 17 and 18 are connected to what? Hadith 16 as well as 13 and 13a. And 14. Okay? All right. Hadith 19. Qala. 
سمعت عليه يقول قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم كل قوم جرى من بعد الشواهد هكذا مرفوعا من الحديث الفقهي وقال حاكم حجر يسأله زاده وله شاهد ضعيف وقد رواه به حقيقي موقوفا عن عدد من مسعود وابن عباس وغيرهما. A cruise. Okay, so uh, we mentioned Al Harith, Al Harith ibn Abi Usama is one of the, the, the collectors of hadith. He had a musnad. That musnad was uh, can, collected by al hafid ibn Hajar and al Matalib al Aliyah, and uh, with you know eight of the different masanid that are outside of the nine major books of hadith. What are the nine major books of hadith? Bukhari, Muslim, and Nasa'i al Tirmidhi, Abu Dawood ibn Majah. That's six. What are the, other, the, the next three? Say again. The Muatta. Some included it, some didn't. Muatta. What else? The Musnad of Imam Ahmed. And then the Sunan of either a Daraqutni or a Darimi. If you wanted to include all of them and say include the Musnad and then Muatta of Imam Malik. Why didn't some scholars include the Muatta of Imam Malik? Because most of the ahadith are repetitive and they're found in Bukhari and Muslim. Okay? And you want to include the Sunan of Ad-Darimi, the Sunan of Ad-Darqutni, then, or the Musnad of Ad-Darimi, and the Sunan of Ad-Darqutni, then you can. After these 10, 11 books of Hadith, there are other Masanid. Al-Harith, Ibn Abi Usama, has one of those lesser known Masanid. Okay? So he narrates this Hadith from Ali that attributes it back to the Prophet Sallallahu directly. It was narrated in marfu' form. Students of hadith, what is a marfu' hadith? Ali, speak into the mic. What was attributed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam directly. And what's a mawquf? It's, it's attributed to a companion. Again, why are we mentioning a hadith as attributed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when Al-Hafidh ibn Hajar, he says that Isnaduhu Saqat, it is despicable, it's, it's fallen down. Why, why are we mentioning it? Number one, we said, we mention it to know that it's been said. And number two, to draw attention that although the narration directly to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is, is, is incorrect, the ruling is correct and it is found in the statements of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam which means that somebody along the way made the mistake and they took the statement of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud or Abdullah ibn Abbas and they attributed it incorrectly to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam but we can trust that the, con that the context of the idea is something that has a basis because we find it reiterated by the earliest generations of Islam consistently until today. Which means that this was not a statement that the Prophet ﷺ said, but it was something that the companions understood from all of the things that he said. And then somebody along the way made the mistake of narrating it as a statement from him directly. So the statement is, Kullu qardin jarra man fa'atan fahuwa riba. Every loan that accrues benefit, then it is riba. So any loan, any me giving money, and then that money being owed, does what? It creates a debt. Any time I charge over a debt or on a debt, then it is going to be riba. So if I charge, if I give you $100, and I tell you pay me back 110 Riba. We mentioned that this is called debt riba. The other day or yesterday, we said this is debt riba. If, and this is debt riba at contract. If I say, I'll loan you $100 and pay me back in a month. And you come back in a month and you say, I can't pay you. you say, okay, pay me $10 extra and I'll give you two more weeks. This is debt riba at default. 
So you've defaulted on the loan, you can't pay it, and so I tell you to pay me more. So this idea, this general principle, is applicable to every situation where a debt is owned. It does not matter if that debt is being paid back as a flat fee or a percentage. It does not matter. It does not matter if that debt is, or that extra thing that is being paid back in addition to the debt is of the same type of asset as the debt or is in addition to it or is something in additionally to it. So somebody goes, well, okay, I borrowed $100 from you, but I don't want to fall into riba, so I'm not going to pay you back 110, but I'll buy you lunch tomorrow. Is that riba or not? Why? Because it's made a condition in the payment of the debt. What if I said, okay, Musa, uh, uh, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to borrow $100 from you. Right now, uh, Miski, uh, te Texas, just a poor guy from Texas. You know, just the poor cattle rancher from Texas. You know, I lost all of my cattle on the Oregon Trail. For some reason, I'm in Minnesota. And I need, I'm going to give you, you know, you're going to give me $100. And then you say, sure, when can you pay me back? Because I'll pay you back tomorrow. I just need you to front me $100. When I go back to Musa the next day, I give him his hundred dollars, and he says, Jazakallah khiyan. So why yeah, barakallah Thank you for allowing me to borrow the money from you. Would you mind if I took you out to lunch? Is that permissible? Why? It's not a condition, and it's being done after the debt was paid. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said it was ahsun al nasi qadaan. He was the best in repaying the debt, in repaying his debts. A man, he had borrowed a camel from a man. And when that man came back to collect his camel, the Prophet didn't have any of the same age of camel that was with him. So the Prophet ﷺ told one of the companions, go and find two camels of similar age and give it to him. So he paid him back two camels for having borrowed one of a different age, right? Would there be a difference in the value there? Yes, but was that difference of value stipulated in the loan? No, it was not. Was it something that was stipulated after the person couldn't pay back? No, it was not. So anything that happens after the fact that's an increase is allowed. So some scholars have said, we can take this principle here and we can modify it. And we can say, كُلُّ قَرْضٍ جَرَّ مَنْفَعَةً مُتَمَحِّضًا لِلْمُقْرِضِ فَهُوَ رِبَا Every loan that accrues a benefit solely to the lender is riba. Because what do I benefit from giving back more or taking him out for lunch or, or, or giving him a gift? What do I benefit? I benefit the hasana of doing so, right? That I'm doing ihsan and paying back the loan. So the problem comes when it's made a condition, right? Not when it's done after the loan is paid and after the fact. Clear? We good? Okay, alhamdulillah. Nuwasa? Okay, bismillah. تعيس عبد الدينار تعيس عبد الدرهم تعيس عبد الخميصة تعيس عبد الخميلة so there's a couple of different narrations from, from this hadith. This hadith is narrated by Bukhari from Abu Huraira. Destroyed is the slave of the dinar, the slave of the dirham, the slave of the shirt, the slave of the jacket. If he's given, he is pleased, and if not, he is not pleased. There is an inherent sense of entitlement found in those people who are insistent in entering into riba-based transactions and uh, 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 gharar based transactions 
and zulm based transactions where they're expecting that they are entitled to get over on, on, on other people. So we have to be extremely cautious of the spiritual effects of bad finance. Spiritual effects of bad finance is that they make us slaves in the church of money. So there's a, there's a fascinating book called The Theology of Money. So now religion in American society has been replaced with finance. The banks are churches and the financiers are the priests. And you can only, you can only be accepted in that church if you sacrifice yourself at the altar of the almighty dollar and you allow yourself to become a slave to the dollar. What's the average, uh, the average salary of a physician in the United States? Over how much money does a physician over the, over the life of his uh, career make on average in the United States? Does anyone know? So when, from the time he finishes school to the time he retires from being a doctor. So let's just say 30 years or 40 years of service as a physician. How much would he or she earn in total? Six million, 6.5 million, 6.5 million, just about, give or take. How much does the average physician retire with, or when they die, how much money do they leave to their children on average? Between $250,000 to $300,000. That's a huge difference, isn't it? Where did all that money go? Huh? Student loans, that's a huge part of it. Student loans is a huge part of it. Where else did it go? Malpractice insurance. Malpractice insurance. Okay, where else did it go? Where else did it go? Lifestyle. Lifestyle. Huge part of it is lifestyle. Because what people do, even if they have to take a student loan out of necessity so that they can finish school, as soon as you graduate, and I know this because I have a number of clients that have finished dentistry and, 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 uh, met, and medical school, and it's before they even graduate, they start, getting, they start getting calls from banks and insurance companies. Hey, you know, we can give you a really good deal. Hey, did you know that we can refinance for you? Hey, did you know that we can sell you an insurance you know, a policy that's going to give you a payoff in X amount of years. So they, they loop them in to starting to continue to pay down on debt. Don't worry about all of the debt that you have. Because you're a physician and you're earning so much money, we don't have any problem to loan you a lot of money over time. And quite frankly, a lot of people are tired of eating ramen noodles and living in their mom and dad's basement or living, you know, in, in, in you know, sharing a room with five, six other people, I said, man, I'm making all this money. I, wanna, I, wanna enjoy, I want to enjoy this money. So the very first year, they go and they buy themselves the nicest car, okay? They have the ridiculously blowout wedding, okay? And a year later, they get a divorce, they lose half of everything, okay? Real situations. And, or they stay married and they're living a ridiculously lavish lifestyle that they're always paying on debt. So they're always using their future earnings to secure current consumption. And what does that do? That drives them deeper and deeper into debt to the point where they are a slave to the money that they use. And that's the last thing that we want. So why are we so adamant about not involving ourselves in riba? not involving ourselves in gharar, in uncertainties, not involving ourselves in, 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 in situations where we take advantage of others because we don't want to be slaves to anybody other than Allah and we don't want anyone else to be slaves to anyone other than Allah as well. So we have the responsibility to take people out of service to service of the servants of Allah, servants of the slaves of Allah, to service of the Lord of those slaves. Like Ribi ibn Amr radiallahu anhu. What did he say when he entered upon Khosrow, the, 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 the emperor of Persia? 
He said, جِئْنَا لِنُخْرِجَكَ مِنْ عِبَادَةِ الْعِبَادِ إِلَىٰ عِبَادَةِ رَبِّ الْعِبَادِ We have come to take you out of, the, of, of, of servitude to the slaves and into the servitude of the Lord of slaves. Because we are all slaves to Allah. Is this something that's a specific thing that Rib'i anhu heard from the Prophet? No, it's what he understood from the Prophet. That everything goes back to Tawheed, even your money. Hadith number 20, everything goes back to Tawheed, even your money. Let's do Hadith 21 and we'll stop there. لا وعند ابن ابن حبان وعند ابن حبان عن ابي هريره قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم من جمع من جمع مالا حراما ثم تصدق به لم يكن له فيه اجر فكان اسمه عليه ابو هريره said about the visit whoever accumulates all wealth and gives it in charity he will have no reward for it and his sin will be on him okay from Abu Hurairah, the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said, Whoever accumulates haram wealth, then gives it in charity, he will have no reward for it, and its sin will be upon him. We are living in a time where it is inevitable that some interest, bear, some interest will touch your account at one time, at some time or another. What do you do in the situation where you have interest bearing or haram wealth that touches your investments, your savings, uh, your tax return, whatever it may be. You take that money and then you give it to the poor. You give it to the poor, not as an act of sadaqah that you're expecting a reward for, but an act of purification and absolution, of ridding yourself of that impure wealth. And number two, not allowing that wealth to stay with the person who engages in riba and make them stronger. So some people say, no, I just go to the bank and I tell them, I don't want the riba, you take it. Okay, you're going to leave the riba with the bank that's going to get stronger and use it for their services even more. I don't know of anyone in the history of Islam except for names that could probably be counted on one hand that have said that that's the case. You should always take that illicit wealth and then give it away in charity and not leave it with the person who had mandated or had brought it into the transaction so that they can get stronger. So who do I give that illicit wealth, that haram earning that came from haram activities or, or, or from riba, who do I give it to? Three approaches by scholars. Some of them said you should give it to the poor and the destitute only. Al-Fuqara wal masakin why? Because from the time that the Qur'an was revealed in Mecca until the end of the Prophet Wasallam's life, the fuqara and the masakin, the poor and the destitute, were always chiefly addressed in the issue of giving, uh, uh, giving money to and helping out of their situation. That's number one. Number two, the second approach is anyone that, can be, that zakah can be paid to, then haram earnings can be paid to. You do not need to tell them where the money is from. You can simply tell them that this is money that's being given to them for the purpose of their poverty, paying off of their debts, freeing a slave, whatever it may be. Okay, Helping them out as refugees, whatever it may be. You don't have to tell them where it's from. Unfortunately, a lot of Islamic organizations make the mistake. People making toba, coming to them saying, I have thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars of interest-based earnings, and I want to get rid of it and purify myself. I want you to take it. And these Islamic organizations go, Astaghfirullah, how can you do, how can you, how can you try and give this to us? And they berate the person for making tawbah. That's not the prophetic way. Prophetic way is that you give it away, you tell that person, Jazakallah khair, may Allah accept your tawbah. This will not count as an act of sadaqah. You will not be rewarded for the money itself, but you will be rewarded for your tawbah. We will take this and we will put it in charitable uh, 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 projects and we encourage you to only earn halal from here on out. The third approach, so we said what? Fuqara wa masakin, poor and destitute. Number two, any of the Categories of zakat, eligible categories of zakat. How many categories of zakat are there? There are eight. 
Or number three, general public works that benefit society but are not used by a single person. So for example, digging a well in a poor village. It's not being, the, one, the money's not being given to a specific person, but it's creating a public utility for everyone to use. Or creating public bathrooms that everyone be able to, to use. Or uh, fixing the roads of all people in a poor area. So that the money's not necessarily going into their pockets, but they are benefiting from it. Which of these three are correct? They're all ijtihadat. They're all attempts to approximate what's best by scholars of Islam, and therefore you can choose whatever is going to be the most beneficial in giving away any illicit uh, funds that you may have earned through investments or bank accounts or tax returns or whatever that may be. And with that, we will conclude. And we have Maghrib in what, five minutes? Already time, so uh, head over to the Musalla. Um, don't head and ask to me and ask me questions. Uh, write your questions down and pass them up. Write them down and pass them up. We will collate the questions. I'm here until Sunday, everyone. So we'll, we, will, we will answer these questions, but you have to write them down and pass them up here. Jazakum Allah khairan wa sallam ala Muhammad.